Thank you very much, Paul. There's just one problem with your restaurants. It's very hard to get a table, although, <laughs> in spite of the fact that it's one of the bigger restaurants in Stockholm. Now, uh, we're going to listen to Errol Schweitzer, who uh, is uh, a food visionary, I would say another food visionary. But he has uh, a unique background in the fact that he spent a long time in the traditional uh, industry in the food chain in um, in Whole Foods, where he was responsible for merchandising, for product assortment, for promotion programs, for more than 80 product categories and five billion dollars in uh, annual sales. And from there, he has moved on, and is now a uh, prophet of uh, of future food. And he has been named uh, one of the top retail game changers in the industry. I think we're all excited and uh, keen to listen to you. Welcome, Aaron. Good morning. So um, I'm going to start with three theses here. Um, I want to talk about climate change. And luckily, it's an audience where I don't have to justify the existence of climate change. So we're going to go right into the food part. And my th the theses here revolve around how do you create a pantry uh, based on regenerative farming, regenerative agriculture, really taking a, a look at what, what you sell, what you buy, what you eat now, but pivoting it towards more sustainable, more holistic methods than we are currently marketing uh, in the food system. And um, the three theses I'm going to start with is the first is that food and agriculture can actually halt and slow the process of climate change. And as a previous speaker, aptly showed, uh, it's usually the opposite now with uh, monoculture, concentrated animal feedlots, the overproduction of animal products, et cetera. Uh, the second is that this thesis of regenerative agriculture is consistent with food trends, um, that you have huge shifts in the marketplace uh, where organic foods is over a $40 billion a year market here in the US. You have the growth of the, the non-GMO marketplace, uh, easily $30 billion here in the US, 500% growth just in the last few years. The resurgence of uh, you know, old uh, traditions such as biodynamic farming, uh, free from foods, uh, allergen free, uh, gluten free, et cetera, as well as trends such as paleo and CrossFit. Essentially, uh, Forbes actually uh, published an article this week saying this is a $1 trillion market, the sort of ethical, holistic, free from uh, food market. And then finally, that this, um, there's an umbrella, I feel, about um, uh, regenerative agriculture that can actually you could talk about food production as being more sustainable and holistic and resilient. That food, uh, when it's produced, can actually restore the inputs. Uh, that food can actually be healthier every year. That uh, food production can be more sustainable every year. Um, and this revolves around seeing sort of two massive systems on this planet as carbon sinks. Uh, and that is soil, um, dirt under, uh, under our feet that grows food, as well as the oceans. Um, and uh, the most important thing about these three theses, for me as a retailer, I ran the grocery division for Whole Foods nationally at over close to 100 product categories and ran the, the grocery stores here as well in, in New York, is that you have to start where the customer is. And so maybe some of what I'm saying will be uh, prosaic uh, as opposed to profound. Um, but me as a retailer, I feel that you actually, you got to start from where people are at. So the first thing I'm actually going to talk about is meat and dairy. Um, and there's new trends coming out showing how you can actually create more resilient, regenerative production systems for what a lot of folks in America eat here. And this includes beef, uh, milk, um, as well as bison. And some of the terms that you may start hearing uh, out in the marketplace include holistic management, uh, production system pioneered by a uh, Zimbabwean uh, scientist named Alan Savory, where the action of ruminants mimics um, uh, wild ruminants uh, being surrounded by predators, essentially creating new ways to time out rotational grazing in fields to uh, really help out the, the production, not only of the, the protein, the meat, the animals, but also restore soil and carbon uh, as well as water. Um, rotational grazing, uh, managed grazing, um, pastured grass fed uh, are all other sort of spins on this, slightly, you know, slightly different paradigms. Um, and then Pennsylvania Certified Organic actually has a certification for organic and uh, pasture raised. Um, and some of the products that you'll see out there in the marketplace already include Epic Bars, which is now owned by General Mills, 
um, Austin-based company. Maple Hill, a New York State-based uh, creamery, uh, who's working closely with the Savory Institute, uh, as well as Tonka Bar, a uh, Native American-owned bison-based uh, product company. And so these sort of meat production systems, when taken as separate from CAFO and monoculture and factory farm, have the potential for not only having healthier proteins, but also restoring, regenerating uh, farmland. Um, to, to carry on to, with the sort of uh, notion of prosaic or, or everyday, um, one of my favorite things to consume is beer. And uh, oddly enough, a company uh, named Patagonia is doing some interesting things with beer. Um, they've actually worked closely with the Land Institute. Uh, for those of you who may be familiar with Wes, Wes Jackson, uh, plant breeder, scientist, writer, philosopher. Um, perennial grains, the notion that you could actually grow grains that mimic the behavior of wild grasses, as well as do the same things to the environment, but grow them for food. Uh, so obviously the, the notion of, or the need for tilling is eliminated, uh, the need for annual seeds uh, is, is eliminated, and they're just sort of in the starting initial phases. And uh, Patagonia has actually launched a product called Long Root Ale. So if you're on the West Coast, it's in several hundred stores. It's a hoppy IPA for, for those of you who care. Um, and essentially, Long Root is because perennial grains, perennial grasses have deep root systems, sequestering carbon dozens of feet down into the soil. And so there's this amazing picture comparing the root system of a conventional wheat plant with a Kernza plant, which Kernza being the grain, and the root system looking like this mutant, uh, enormous, uh, creature, and really that's the secret to it, you know, drought resistant and tolerant uh, to disease. Um, so essentially Patagonia has thrown the first shot across the bow of uh, making a product with it. So what's next? Maybe it's kerns of bread, maybe it's kerns of pasta, maybe it's kerns of cookies, who doesn't like cookies? But you have cookies that can restore uh, the climate, that can pull carbon out of the atmosphere. And the third one um, mentioned just previously is, is seaweed, kelp, and so looking at the oceans as a carbon sink. So ocean farming, not, as a, not in terms of aqua monoculture, but in terms of creating diverse systems that are built around kelp and uh, seaweed farms. Um, so you can absorb nutrient runoff from, uh, from factory farms, from, from conventional agriculture, including nitrogen and phosphorus. You could prevent ocean acidification. Uh, and then most importantly, you could absorb carbon. And one, one farm, uh, a 20 acre farm, 30 tons of kelp per, uh, per acre they're able to produce. It's an incredible amount of product. Uh, but also, it's a it's multi-species system that you have shellfish, bivalves that can, can live, that you're restoring fisheries. You have fish that are swimming beneath these massive strands of kale. Uh, I'm sorry, ke uh, kelp. Um, and so ocean farms, they're estimating the size of Washington state, could feed a large portion of the, the world's population. A couple other systems, more in the, uh, you know, more in the conceptual sense, restoration agriculture using silvopasture systems, uh, where you're using different uh, multi-cropping uh, techniques that revolve around woody plants, and that could uh, include hazelnuts or pecans or oak, uh, and then you have different types of botanicals, uh, herbs, wild berries, uh, sorry, uh, berries that you could plant in between in rows uh, for harvest. So just imagine uh, a, a food system where you've got Peren uh, perennial, re you know, regenerative Nutella. You know, this is what I'm talking about, like taking this pivot of you have restoration, regenerative agriculture, but it's something that all of us love. Uh, but you can also produce apples and berries and herbs. Um, and then finally, the original regenerative agriculture system, which has always talked about climate or, and carbon uh, and soil, is, is biodynamic. And it's over 100 years old, formulated first by Rudolf Steiner uh, in Europe. And so it's, it's based on the organic system, uh, but it also gave rise to the organic system. The whole notion of a farm as an organism came out of biodynamics. So no genetically modified organisms, no synthetic pesticides or fertilizers. The farm is integrated as a whole, so plant and animal systems uh, coexist. There's a big focus on pollinators, and many of you are familiar with the concerns of colony collapse disorder here in the United States. Um, but it also mandates that 10% of the farm remains wild so that you're, you're not creating these monocultures where you're destroying speci uh, species uh, habitat and uh, killing diversity. Low and no-till so that you're not tilling the soil that releases carbon uh, back into the atmosphere um, and that you're producing livestock in addition to plant uh, and uh, botanical species. Um, and essentially, one of the things to consider here within all these systems is that instead of geoengineering or bioengineering, just going back to photosynthesis as, as really the core 
uh, concept here of how you can actually restore the climate, but also create food. Essentially, carbon equals food, right? So how are you taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and turning it into to food choices? So, you know, in conclusion, um, it's important that we keep food choices familiar, uh, that we are able to speak to a large portion of the population. And, you know, I'm, I'm a foodie, and I love going to great restaurants, um, and I, I've been fortunate to have a good income. But here in the United States, you have vast portions of the population that don't have access to good food, that don't have you know, high incomes, that aren't able to go to the trendiest restaurants. So if we want to make large scale changes, we have to figure out how you can do these changes in a way that is comforting, is familiar, is, is easy to conceptualize, that is, is cost effective, um, and that appeals to a large portion of the population. Um, and then finally, regenerative agriculture needs to be economically viable. And I, you know, I was a retailer, I'm still a retailer, and we always have a PL. And so for me, having it pounded into my head to make the financial targets um, is not something that I think that we should let go of. We should be economically responsible in how we do uh, regenerative agriculture. And so I'm going to conclude here with some further resources. So don't take my word on it. Um, some great resources include Carbon Underground, uh, Regeneration International, Acres USA, Rodale Institute has done some amazing studies, including a 30-year crop study comparing conventional bioengineered organic systems and now regenerative systems, and then other organizations such, such as Kiss the Ground, New Hope, um, and some great, great articles on Yale, on Yale 360. And then once again, the um, holistic management uh, resource I would say to check out would be the Savory Institute. Uh, so thank you so much.